So we'll start with the paper by Toby James and Holly Garnett. But from what I understand, Toby is making the presentation today, right? Okay, and then we'll have the paper by Maddie Hardy. And then finally, the paper by Ludvi Ediono. Did I pronounce your name right? Good. Great. And just as a reminder to the presenters, we'd like you to keep the presentation 10 to 15 minutes. If you're getting close to 15 and it's not wrapping up, I'll send you a private message in the chat. Uh, or if, if you reach the time, then I'll just intervene to let you know that you reached the time. Okay. And then after that, um, Kelsey will be serving as our discussant. All right. So Toby, go ahead and take it away. Okay, great. So the first test is whether you can see that okay. It's all appeared. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you so much, Daniela, for, for kindly uh, uh, chairing uh, the session. I'm really excited to see uh, all the work that's going to be spread out across the conference looking at electoral justice, because I think this is one of the, the pressing issues of our time when it comes to elections, but also potentially one of the issues that's understudied and we sort of seem in shock or maybe it's just me but often we've been in shock when it's been not the voters directly that are making the decisions about who wins the election but the judges you know many very very high profile cases around the world of the highest court of the land having the final decision as to who is the president or who is the winner of the election so obviously one of the famous cases was in the US in the 2000 presidential election, Bush versus Gore, which feels like a long, long, long time ago um, in which the, the Supreme Court um, made that final call as to whether particular votes should be counted or not counted. And so the, it, the winner of the election hang on that decision. Similarly, much more recently, uh, we had um, in Malawi, uh, the 2019 presidential election was annulled um, in early in, in 2020 um, with uh, elections, fresh elections demanded to be called as a result. So clearly these are pivotal events, but there's also lots of other uh, moments at which electoral justice is being uh, decided but at the local level um, as, as, as well. So this is the first outing of a paper and um, comments very, very, very welcome in terms of our sort of directions for it. Um, what we aim to do here is um, try to think about electoral justice as a whole, um, trying to think about a, a general model for trying to understand the process of delivering electoral justice and some of the, the, the problems that there are uh, as part of it. So I'll introduce some of the literature that we're, we're aware of to begin with. I'm sure there's lots that we've missed. Um, introduce our sort of framing of our model and then some of the empirical data that we're looking at um, at the moment. So in terms of electoral justice, um, it seems, as far as we're aware, that this is one of the areas of the electoral cycle where there just isn't as much work. There's, you know, electoral systems, for example, was one of the, the most explored areas of the electoral cycle, that process of, of um, converting votes into seats. We know lots about voter identification, we know lots, of, lots about electoral campaign finance, but actually how uh, cases are adjudicated on, or even how cases get to that point, seems to be a real um, a gap in the literature. Um, so just to give an example, this is the one of our slides from last year, the perceptions of electoral integrity index it's not particularly clear that in, in that in this case um, electoral justice is particularly prominent as I stage in the electoral cycle. It is in some cases, so this is the ACE electoral cycle, and you can see here, slap bang in the middle, they've put complaints and uh, appeals as part of it, but nonetheless, you know, should the electoral cycle include electoral justice quite, quite firmly as part of it. Some of the key texts seem to be those that are developed by the international community. It's kind of grey literature documents uh, to begin with. Again, international idea were sort of a pioneer uh, in many senses here with their electoral justice handbook. Um, and they define electoral justice um, in general terms as the means and mechanisms for ensuring that 
each action, procedure, and decision related to the electoral process is in line with the, with the law and for protecting or restoring the enjoyment of electoral rights uh, and so on. And so their, their handbook, as well as work uh, by IFAS, sets out how they think the electoral justice process should, should work. There's lots of studies, um, rich studies uh, looking at particular countries, um, studies uh, from legal studies in particular, from law and law journals looking at important cases. Um, a lot of the work there tends to be trying to extrapolate what the law should be and whether the law is right or right or, right or wrong, uh, rather than again looking at across countries to think of thinking about this. There is some recent work though however particularly um, that has looked at presidential uh, elections and some of the different ways in which the process is, is adjudicated um, there and some comparative work um, by, uh, by Nicholas Kerr and colleagues um, who look at elections in Kenya um, although it's a single country study they look at the different ways in which parties and candidates act strategically to raise electoral complaints. It's, they, they point out uh, very clearly um, that this isn't just about people trying to raise the case to get justice for, for, for problems. People are also raising cases um, uh, strategically, perhaps potentially to delegitimize de de uh, the winner of the election. So there's lots of potential work, uh, lots of exciting things, um, but still quite a lot of scope uh, for, 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 doing, for doing more. So the theoretical framework, uh, I think this is more of a conceptual paper, that's our main kind of contribution here. Uh, the conceptual framework kind of goes as follows. Um, we think of electoral integrity as, um, as an important process to deliver democracy. Democracy is conceived uh, as a system in which all individuals are basically empowered. Uh, They're empowered and everyone has kind of equal op op opportunity. So elections play this crucial role they're not just democracy, it's not just about elections. Uh, elections are one kind of crucial mechanism uh, for empowering people. But as we know, elections have flaws. Uh, elections, the quality of elections around the world uh, varies enormously. And this gives rise to grievances. Uh, people feel frustrated, people have injustices uh, occur to them. And it's not just citizens that have these grievances occur to them. It might be political parties where they feel unfairly treated and are unfairly treated. It might be individual candidates. Uh, it might be electoral officials that feel that something has, has, not, has gone awry uh, because someone else has enacted some grievances. It might be civil society groups um, here um, as well. And the form in which those grievances take place uh, can, can, can vary. I'll come on to that kind of shortly. So in this sense, how we're defining electoral justice is in terms of uh, the effective remedy of, griev of grievances. And so there's three stages, we, uh, we argue, to electoral justice in what uh, we kind of call a electoral justice accountability model. The first stage is this information gathering stage where people become aware uh, that there is some kind of grievance in the first place. They become aware um, that there is a problem and that there can be a variety of different sources um, of that information. And we argue that what's, what's important for electoral justice is that people do have access to full, complete and accurate information about the quality of the election itself. So this could be in, in the form of the financial accounts of, of uh, parties. Um, it's also important that EMBs actually open themselves up for scrutiny because Sometimes people might be aware of how well or how badly the, the, the EMB is doing, but information is really important. But also election monitors play a, a crucial role here too, in terms of contributing towards the information environment. Then at the second stage, there are grievances. People have frustrations and, and concerns about the, about the electoral process, and this can take different forms depending on different stages of the electoral cycle and who they are. So, you know, ahead of the election, for example, um, there are opportunities to do things. It might be diplomatic methods, um, which the literature says much less about, but having a word through embassies might be one, one route that, that um, stakeholders might want to um, raise their concerns about the electoral process. During the electoral cycle, then, might be things like election monitoring and so on. And then post-election, uh, uh, 
methods as well. And then resolution is like the final stage. And what's, what's important about resolution here is that there is a decision made and due legal process um, is, is followed. So there's some puzzles and problems though. Um, to Partly this is about measurement, but I think there's some conceptual problems um, or some political problems for democracies to, to work their way through. So the first one is that there are knowledge gaps. People um, may have limited access to sources of information, which is why conceptually, um, you know, a good uh, process involves lots of in rich information about uh, the quality of the electoral process. The second thing is that there might be silent concerns. People might not actually get to stage two, raising their grievances, because in if those grievances are particularly severe, they might actually be worried about what would happen to them on an individual family or group basis if they were to raise those concerns. So we might not actually ever hear um, of, of problems and um, they might not be expressed by citizens. Problems of false claims, uh, opponents um, might, as, as Nick Cohen and colleagues have pointed out, they might raise criticisms of the electoral process, not on the basis of um, kind of fact, but actually deliberately to uh, delegitimize the winner um, of, of the election. And the final problem is, how do we normatively deal with this, um, this, this problem where there are grievances? This process here and the process sketched out by the international community always focuses on a legal process. You know, the, the, how do you get remedy? You follow the process through this. But obviously, often political processes might be needed as well. Uh, if grievances are not heard within the system that actually caused the grievances in the first place, you know, what, what are we actually expecting citizens and stakeholders um, to do? So kind of the research questions that kind of followed um, was to think about how we measure electoral justice. Um, how do we kind of sketch out these patterns around the world? Um, and how these kind of patterns also correspond to some of the other variables and things we know about um, the drivers of electoral integrity in, 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 in general. And so we use some of the PEI indicators um, I sort of alluded to to begin with, thinking about these three stages, the information stage or the visibility stage, these are some of the indicators we think about here, the grievance stage and the resolution stage. And in the, in the paper, we develop a, a very simple um, index for each of those three dimensions, um, simply using, um, you know, kind of developing the mean across the board. So this then is the, the quality of the electoral process according to these indicators. So first of all, the information stage, and you can see variations in terms of darker colours here are, are countries where you have higher quality information available to uh, people who want to raise grievances. We then have the grievances, which are not the, not the same as the information stage. And again, remember, we are open here that this is not necessarily about the quality of elections. This is the extent to which grievances are raised and are visible because we have conceptualized this as parties challenging the results, the election leading to protests or, or violent, whether violently or otherwise. And then finally, whether um, there is good adjudication process if, if and when those results um, kind of come through. So then thinking then in terms of patterns of electoral justice, and I think where, I think where, we're, where we're thinking is that most of the existing literature tends to be, you know, the grey literature describes things um, in terms of how, think, how processes sh should work. We map out some kind of, um, uh, sort of two dimensional patterns here. First, so first of all, in terms of grievance, grievance versus a visibility. So visibility, to what extent do people know about or have good access to information about uh, the quality of the election versus to which there are um, kind of grievances kind of kind of raised and um, some of these figures aren't kind of super clear and we need to kind of kind of, kind of work kind of work a bit on, on, on those but this is probably the one that um, I sort of found the most interesting is where we're mapping grievances against resolution um, so grievances you can see kind of quadrant a at the top there You've got countries where you've got high level grievances and they're not being resolved. You've got then got on the section B and you've got high level grievances and high resolution. So 
that you see low grievances with low resolution, so people not really raising their concerns. And then, it's a, sorry, it's a bit, a bit poorly illustrated, but the bottom there, low grievances, but high resolution. I think it's a relatively simple point, but it's an important one, which is that in terms of best practices of electoral justice, it's mostly segment D, the lots of the literature, or lots of the grey literature, um, or the best practices um, point to. So people look to Norway and, and Finland and the Netherlands and Denmark and, and so on and say, well, these are countries with high levels of electoral integrity and you know, this, is, this is where the lesson drawing should come from. But one argument that we're developing actually is it's segment B that potentially are the best world's con the countries that show evidence of best practices. So examples like Ghana, like Kenya, where you get high grievances raised and they are resolved effectively. And we need to sort of turn the, the story on its head in some ways and think about these as being some amongst countries where that we should examine more closely through, through, through case studies. And I think that's probably the way the paper is going um, as being examples of, of, of best practice. We do do some- uh, Will we just wrap yep. up? You have about a minute to wrap up. That's fine, on schedule. Um, so we, we did do some initial regressions to, just, to, just to look at some of the patterns um, of, of electoral justice in terms of those three dimensions, visibility, information, grievances and resolution, and to work out, you know, do they kind of map onto uh, existing dimensions? And to some extent, you know, yes, um, liberal democracies, we're seeing better information, better resolution and less grievances. So that, that, that does seem to sort of that, that does kind of seem to sort of play out, play out um, there to, to some extent. But, so by way of conclusion, our lessons are, we think that electoral justice is important. It's in, indispensable for everyone to get, to get their, their grievances heard and due process, that it's understudied. Our, our, our paper aims to think about some of those problems that there are in terms of delivering electoral justice. Um, we think that you know, the crucial ingredients of electoral justice, something that's often missed out in some of the great literature is about the information environment and how actually access to key, good quality information is a key ingredient of electoral justice. And actually some of these discussions need to be a bit more data driven, a bit more evidence based around the countries and the case studies where there has been success. And the case studies that potentially are the most interesting is not the cases where um, there's been few cases to deal with, it's the countries that have been under stress and strain. And those are the countries we think that deserve further critical examination um, and lesson drawing rather than uh, so-called traditional older established democracies we might expect some big issues with electoral grievances on the, on the horizon. Okay, we'll move on to our next presentation by Madeline Hardy from University of Denver. Great. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me all. Uh, my name is Madeline Hardy or Maddie Hardy. Um, from the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies here in sunny Denver, Colorado. And I'm excited to talk to you about my paper, When Electoral Crises Challenge Constitutional Integrity. So my key research question for this paper was under what conditions do constitutional rules of the game survive electoral crises? And when do such crises sever political settlements and vitiate constitutional rules? So you can see from this question, my key interests were regarding political settlements and other um, agreed upon operating norms, especially in the form of the Constitution, um, which in turn, a lot of it, this was then borrowed from Constitution literature or other game theory literature. And so for a really brief overview of my methodology, um, I conducted a structured focused comparison of three case studies. I used the Venezuela 2017 Constituent Assembly election, the 2020 US presidential election, and the 2024 Senegal presidential election. And for my key findings, I really focused on two outcomes that were consistent in these three case studies. And that was one, that political elite can manipulate public participation and two, use institutional backstops 
to challenge constitutional integrity following electoral crises. So for this presentation, I'll give an overview of the questions I asked while conducting this research and the structure of those questions. Then I'll deep dive a little bit into my US case study, uh, which I'm happy to do so after this morning's panel. I think Toby mentioned there wasn't a US voice yet, um, even though that's widely talked about. So here I am um, to be that US voice in this moment. Um, and then go over some overview from the rest of my case studies and broader discussion. So as for my five questions that I asked um, and analyzed for each case study of the three, the first was really the framework of it all, the constitutional framework and means of electoral contestation. And this really borrowed from International Ideas Constitution Building Team, um, which looks at how constitutions have measures to anticipate or prevent crisis. So I was curious on what those measures are um, and the frameworks to help, again, anticipate or really mitigate these challenges. The second question um, borrows from scholar Jack Balkin, and I looked at evidence of constitutional rot um, and seeing how there was a, degra a degrading or decay of constitutional norms by either political elite or citizens. Um, and I found this to be important as the ultimate challenge to constitutional integrity did not happen in a vacuum. Uh, there had to be a buildup to get to that point. And so studying the rot um, to get there, following analyzing the foundation of the existing framework. Question three um, is the drivers, the episode itself, and then the result of that electoral crisis and viewing electoral crises as a decision point of a deviation from the set electoral process itself. Question four, I looked at evidence of constitutional hardball um, borrowed from Mark Tishnet and seeing how, when a political elite perceive threats to their power, how they view that as an opportunity to redefine um, constitutional order and create tension within the constitutional bounds. And so almost as an example here, looking at this kind of ever blowing up balloon and constitutional hardball being that fourth step of just ultimate tension point created before a potential burst, um, the burst being that final challenge to constitutional integrity which is number five. And I looked at the resulting constitutional integrity through a view of, or through a lens of resilience and looking at constitutional resilience. So looking at the US as an example, um, the US in the case of the 2020 election and then 2021 vote certification commonly referred to um, as January 6th, the, the day of the events itself. For the constitutional framework, um, the US as the oldest um, or having the oldest written constitution framework has a clear division of power and authority between state and Congress. Um, but given its historical precedent, there's also plenty of ambiguous procedures within that. Um, for example, the article that I'll refer to um, later on that was key in the constitution here to get specific, article two, section one, clause three, um, lists that the president of the Senate, which is the vice president, must open all cert certificates and votes shall then be counted when talking about vote certification. And the ambiguity kind of in this old document then leaves room for manipulation elsewhere. Also important to note for constitutional culture in the U.S. Um, is a historic precedent of a peaceful transition of power up until 2020 or 2021. So with this basis, then studying the constitutional rot of it all, we saw how following the 2020 vote, incumbent President Donald Trump began using a rhetoric that decayed some constitutional norms and began discussing a deviation from the certification procedure. I think this is widely documented on Twitter or X, as we saw from the president following um, tweets after the election that, um, in all caps, I won this election. Another tweet, this fake election can no longer stand, get moving Republicans. And this beginning of public persuasion to decay norms of peaceful transitions of power, as well discussing with other political elite potential, potential to deviate from certification procedures laid out in the constitution or the norms that were following the existing constitution um, framework. And so for the events, um, in question number three on January 6th and early morning of January 7th, um, to spare all of the news details, we saw the group of people um, following a speech from the president at the White House ellipse march down to the U.S. Capitol building 
and break in stopping the vote counting procedure in a violent manner. And so when it comes to elite decision making, we saw President Trump push for Vice President Mike Pence for noncompliance and to do so through the Eastman memo named after the lawyer that conceived the plan, um, which was pushing for the vice president to unilaterally reject votes um, from the Senate itself. So kind of pushing that const or pushing the institution rather um, to side with with the incumbent president. And Vice President Pence chose to follow the rules of the game um, and follow the constitutional norms and the set procedures in the constitution for vote certification and really did so to his own detriment. Um, there are plenty of actions to hang the vice president after doing so. So following and in the midst of this episode as well is where we see that constitutional hardball, that really push of tension within bounds. And here's where we start, um, especially focusing on the public engagement factor. And we saw how the president, um, President Trump, used the crisis as public permission to challenge the Constitution. So seeing the rioters outside of the Capitol as public engagement um, to promote the deviation from the set norms. On the flip side, we saw other elite perceptions change when the crowd mobilized to include a lot of Republicans texting um, the president's team asking him to call them off or to go through with the vote procedure. I think this example is really interesting in lieu of discussion on electoral justice and recent events. As question number five, the resulting constitutional integrity, it's a little bit of TBD or to be determined. Um, oh, when I first wrote this paper, I focused the result as kind of a moderate example. Um, yes, the constitutional integrity withstood the challenge um, really because of one keeper, the vice president, as well as the institution, the Senate that helped to back him. Um, but there definitely was an emotional stain on American democracy and seeing how some norms began to change on peaceful transitions of power um, and what that sort of certification looks like. But the recent actions from the U.S. Supreme Court um, see how there might not be full electoral justice in this case, um, given the partial immunity to the president now following the acts of January 6th. So seeing how this compares to the other cases I selected and just an overview of their results in Venezuela, um, I studied how the regime and widespread government authorities um, mixed with the regime silenced, if not absolutely squandered, uh, public participation and hollowed the rules of the game by overtly going against the constitutional regulations for calling a constituent assembly. And therefore, in conditions of vast regime influence, constitutional rules do not survive regime-initiated electoral crises and become severed political settlements that inhibit democracy. I don't think this is very shocking um, to people in this room. In the US example, as I went through, the constitution survived the crisis because of one democratic peacekeeper, the vice president and the Senate institution that backed him, who held constitutional integrity to his own political detriment. The crisis shocked American democracy in severing political settlements like peaceful transitions of power and exhibited how political elite must have security to act against the incumbent regime and were helped by those institutions. In Senegal, which I viewed kind of as my best example of protecting integrity, the Constitutional Council was supported by widespread public protest and in turn promoted constitutional rules and survived a president-led crisis, which is when President Macky Sall pushed for the election delay and the council overturned. In this, government branches acted against the regime and loud voices promoted a following of the rules of the game. So to conclude on this overall discussion and back to the key points, I think the first point um, is of no, no shock to this field that independent institutions are key for the survival of constitutional rules during electoral crisis. This was really seen in Senegal and then partially seen in the US, um, but the question remains on the electoral justice aftermath. What I also found interesting was this point on public participation and how it can either be manipulated to vitiate norms, um, like in the US and the president using public participation to help vitiate those norms or help promote them, like in Senegal, um, when public participation was supporting the Constitutional Council. And so I think this emphasizes the importance of rhetoric from political elite. 
And overall, I view these two points as kind of the precursor to this crisis and challenge and electoral justice as this aftermath question, uh, which I think is interesting to study it maybe as a full spectrum to look at independent institutions and public participation as backstops to these challenges um, and the resulting electoral justice afterward. So thank you very much um, for any further questions outside of this panel. I can be reached at my email here and thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Maddie, right on time. And for our third paper, we have a presentation by Luthvi Ediono, who's from the Constitutional Court of Indonesia. And um, Luthvi, is your co-author here as well, or are you just doing yes, a presentation? Uh, I'm going to speak by myself. Okay, great. Go ahead and get started whenever you'd like. Thank you so much. Um, I have a problem with my PPT. Please... Uh... Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, it's everyone. Not in the, it's not in the full screen mode. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, that's right. We can see the slides, but you might try to put it in the slideshow mode. Wait a few seconds. I have a problem. Can I just talk? Because I you I can certainly yes. Okay, you, you can so certainly much. do that. Hello, uh, everyone. Good evening from Jakarta. My name is Lutfi Widakto Ediono. I'm an expert assistant at the Indonesian Constitutional Court of the Republic of Indonesia. I start working with the court since 2005. It's quite long, and I also have my co-author Trisul Sanning Asuti. is a master student of political science, Universitas Islam International Indonesia. So my paper is about compliance of the final and binding decisions of the Constitutional Court analysis of decisions number 116, 2023, related to the parliamentary threshold. Uh, the Constitutional Court of Indonesia is established in 2003, is uh, quite powerful right now. Uh, the court have five authority, one of these uh, authority is judicial review cases and also handle the, the, the uh, conflict of the state's institutions. And the court also have authority to handle the election cases. And the decision of the court is final and binding. That's why, uh, uh, because of this, the court tries to be consistent in many of its decisions. However, the constitutional court changed its stance and some of the decisions in elections use open legal policy arguments is the terms, uh, probably like in US, we call it uh, political questions, uh, especially for decisions number 116, 2023, on the parliamentary threshold in February 2024, because uh, the parliamentary threshold of 4% is uh, unconstitutional. The electoral change through the constitutional court are not static, because uh, uh, so many cases come to the court, and uh, because the last decisions changed uh, the interpretation of the court uh, of the constitutions. And it's really very close related to the consolidated democratic process. So my question is, what is the nature of the constitutional court decisions, particularly final and binding to the decision of the parliamentary threshold 2023? My method is a qualitative juridical normative method and especially for the constitutional court decisions regarding parliamentary threshold and elections law in Indonesia. I'm gonna uh, 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 give you information about the nature of the constitutional court. Uh, the court itself is stated by the 1945 constitutions and the law number 24 of 2003 that concerns the constitutional court has a, the authority to adjudicate at the first and the last level whose decisions are final. So in Indonesian context, the Constitutional Court has a similar level with the Supreme Court. Uh, the difference is that the court uh, only handled the constitutional matters. And the final nature of the Constitutional Court decisions also includes binding, a legal force, or final binding. There is non-implementation of the decisions. First, 
the argumentation that the Constitutional Court is only a negative legislature. The absence of special enforcement agencies, the absence of a time limit for implementing decisions, no legal consequences for ignoring the decisions of the Constitutional Court. Uh, constitutionality of parliament's threshold for electoral reforms. What is electoral reform? Electoral reform was carried out as a deliberate action to promote fairness in elections, representations, efficiency in the election systems, the desire to improve government governance, and through the implementation of new mechanisms, institutional and regulatory reforms that take advantages of the weaknesses of the existing electoral systems. So the parliamentary threshold decisions is going to improve the functions of democracy, the fulfillment of voting rights, and the presentation of citizens. The open legal policy risks on the continuity of electoral reforms. So until uh, from 2007 until 2020, there are seven submissions on parliamentary threshold judicial review. Uh, all of it were rejected or acceptable, and the threshold uh, uh, were implemented from 2.5%, 3.5%, and the latest is 4%. And the Constitutional Court decision to increase representations cannot necessarily be considered reforms because the consequences of the phrase open legal policy, that handing over the fate of changes to election rules to the legislature. First, it become remain as reforms. Second, instruments to achieve interests that diminish democratic failures. One of the considerations of the Constitutional Court is the adequate basic methods and arguments to minimize disproportionality between valid votes and determining the number of states in the DPR. DPR is means parliament, while strengthening the simplification of political parties. So uh, the open legal policy as judicial restraints. Judicial restraints is an effort to create a professional separation of power, especially on judicial authority. But the effect on the compliance with the final decision is that legislature will tend to comply because they are given appropriate space to carry out their duties. And political competitions, the implementation of the constitutional court decisions will experience many adjustments or even distortion of interest. I think that's the last of my, my slides. Thank you so much. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so now we'll have discussion uh, from Kelsey Burkhart, University of Denver. Uh, and Kelsey, you feel free to um, take up your time of at most 15 minutes. Um, and then after that, we can move to questions from the audience. Thanks. Um, I have just a few comments on kind of the first two papers here. So I don't think I'll go quite, quite to the 15 minutes. Um, but um, on Toby and Holly's paper, first, I just want to say that I think this is a really interesting paper that highlights something that hasn't really been studied very systematically and yet seems to underpin so many important discussions that we're having today about election quality and the legitimacy of election results, which is only growing more important as we continue to see efforts to undermine the legitimacy of elections around the world. Um, I have just a few comments largely related to how you're operationalizing some of these concepts, how you're thinking about false claims of grievance in particular, um, and how some of these concepts might interact with where a country falls on the democracy spectrum or the democracy to autocracy spectrum. Um, first, your concept for grievance under electoral justice appears to be primarily about challenging the results of an election, but I wonder where something like challenging a candidate being ruled out of contesting an election might fall. Um, do you also kind of consider those earlier claims as part of electoral justice grievances, or does that kind of fall outside of your concept? Um, I'm thinking in particular about Senegal from one of Maddie's cases, um, for example, where part of the justification for the election postponement centered on two key candidates being prevented from running. Um, another kind of potential example here would be some of the cases in the U.S. over district gerrymandering and just some of those earlier sorts of electoral um, grievance claims. Um, it seems to me that some of those types of cases might fit nicely into your pre-election grievances section, um, but I didn't see them kind of there already, so I was just curious about that. 
Um, I'm also curious about how time horizons in particular factor into your oper operationalization of adjudication. Um, thinking in particular about those ongoing cases from the US from the last election in which there's still a lot of actors kind of being held accountable or not for some of their efforts to undermine the election. Um, what timeline are you thinking about with that adjudication variable in its operationalization? Um, how far after the election are you thinking about those adjudication claims um, being carried out? Um, under grievance, um, I also wonder how you're thinking about false claims of grievance in particular, you know, and you allude to this both in your presentation and in the paper, um, that there's definitely been some speculation that as we've seen more involvement of the judiciary in overturning election results or just ruling on election results more generally, that it might bolster losing candidates' willingness to make false claims in their judicial systems um, against election results in an effort to undermine the legitimacy of the elections or the true winner of the election. Um, I'm curious how you're thinking about differentiating among some of those false claims in your data set, or if you're thinking about that distinction and kind of how that's going to play out um, and how you might think about doing that in the future. And then this is maybe outside the scope of this particular paper, but um, thinking about in particular that first set of quadrants that you had about visibility versus grievance. I'm curious about how those quadrants also map onto levels of democratic quality um, or something like VDEM's electoral democracy or liberal democracy indices. Um, are we seeing more cases of grievance and what we might generally consider to be something like a competitive authoritarian regime or just perhaps less adjudication in those regimes? Um, or do we tend to see certain newly transitioned democracies in a certain category or something like that? Um, I'm kind of thinking about that as like uh, differentiating like different sets of those quadrants among different regime types or something like that and seeing if that gives us any more analytic leverage or gives your data any more analytic leverage. Um, I think it's really interesting when you started to go into some of those best practices discussions when you were thinking about that with your second set of quadrants in particular, you know, um, thinking about how more established liberal democracies might face um, challenges in delivering electoral justice just because they've so rarely had to deal with some of those adjudication claims. Um, and I, I think I agree with kind of your overarching point that we should be paying attention to some of those countries like Ghana and Kenya where there's high grievances but also high adjudication. Um, and I think it would be really useful to kind of build out um, some of those case studies in your paper as well. I think those are both really interesting case studies. Um, for Maddie's paper, um, again, first, I want to say that I, I also think this is a very interesting project. And as you know, this is closely in line with my own research interests as well. So I really appreciated your thorough literature review and discussion in this paper. Um, for you, I have just a few broad comments on case selection and framing um, and some additional literature that I think you might want to engage with just a bit further. Um, I'm curious first on how Venezuela was chosen as one of the case studies for inclusion here, um, given that to me it seems just a little bit different from the other two on a few key factors. Um, first, you know, the level of buy-in to the existing political settlement to me seemed already pretty low in Venezuela at the time of that election. Um, to the degree that I really wonder if there was a lot of buy-in to the existing political settlement at all. Um, the type of election being a bit different with it being a constituent assembly instead of a presidential election, um, like the other two cases makes the stakes of the election a little bit different. So I wonder if that's also part of why we're seeing the results there. Um, and then there was already a lot more significant eroding of the political rules of the game to the degree that we wouldn't really consider it to be a democracy during the time frame of the case. So I wonder how that also kind of factors in there. Um, in the paper itself, you focus a lot more on the role of the incumbent in starting the electoral crisis and the role of the judiciary in solving the crisis. And I think in your presentation, you made a much broader point um, about the role of the political opposition, civil society actors, the public more generally, and how, pol um, how political elites kind of um, can can manipulate that public perception um, more generally. And I would just suggest that in the paper itself, you make the sections within your case studies on those other actors a little bit more detailed so that when you make that later point in your analysis, um, there's clearer links to that point within your case studies. 
Um, one of the things in particular, um, as you know, I look at Senegal is in, in my work as well. Um, and one of the things that I think gets lost in some of the discussions about Senegal's recent election, um, particularly in a lot of the press discussions about this, is that actually a lot of several prominent um, opposition actors had also requested an election postponement prior to Saul's announcement. Um, so the constitute and, and that was for the constitutional court cases on their candidacies to be reviewed, right? So there was a judicial aspect to that as well. Um, so there's, I, I think, a, a bit more complication to the Senegal case than, than we tend to see in a lot of the press accounts when we think about that postponement. Um, I think it's often presented as kind of Saul um, taking the taking the initiative and wanting to kind of gain the upper hand there but there were also a lot of opposition actors that were calling for a postponement as well for different reasons um kind of a related point for your literature review you've engaged really thoroughly with the literature on constitutional integrity but i think there's some room to further engage with the broader literature on democratic erosion and backsliding as a whole um, there's some really great papers, and I'll send these to you offline, um, by Anna Lerman and Lisa Reichner in particular, that I think kind of help bridge part of the gap that you're focusing on um, in how civil society actors in particular can kind of help prevent democratic erosion from becoming full democratic breakdown. And they've both highlighted the role that civil society actors play in encouraging judicial actors in particular to actually perform their constitutional check on executive actors' bad behavior. So focusing on that sort of civil society society and public protest end and how that can help activate judicial actors to kind of do the right thing and uphold that constitutional integrity that you're talking about. Um, and then kind of a semi-related point, and this is my last point um, on uh, that I think is more about framing than about content. Um, in the paper itself, you're alluding to kind of a game theory informed dilemma that actors are um, using a few times at the beginning and the end of the paper, but I don't really see you leaning on that framing in your case studies themselves very much. Um, and I'm not really sure you gain any additional analytic leverage by presenting it using that game theory framing. Um, so I think you could kind of go one of two directions with that. Um, the first is that I don't necessarily think you need the game theory framing for your argument. I think the structured focus comparison is actually enough and perhaps reframing that as sort of incentives that actors have to behave in certain ways, both on the incumbent and their opponent's side would really be sufficient to make your overarching point about constitutional integrity. Um, alternatively, if you think that game theory piece is really critical to your argument, I would just suggest that you lean further into it and kind of bring that out more in your case studies as well and kind of bring out those dilemmas more clearly in the specific case study discussions. Um, that's all I had. So thank you. Um, and thanks for three really great presentations here. I really appreciate it.